Hi. Um, I'm very glad to be here. I'm, I'm so glad to be at this great school, and I'm really excited um, to be here with these other wonderful speakers, who, some of whom I know. Um, when Amy approached me and asked me to give a talk on puzzles, it was really easy for me to think of an idea, because I've been puzzling over this question um, for some time now, which is, what is a book anymore? And the reason why I have this question is, um, because of digital publishing. Digital publishing is changing books very quickly. Um, before I want to talk about that, I want to make clear that I'm a big fan of paper books. I have many. I was going to take pictures of all the books in my house, and then I, my husband told me that would be a little excessive. But I thought I'd just show you this one um, example of a bookshelf near our um, front door. For me, a, a good book is a is a a book that really kind of delves into a topic in depth and um, uses artful storytelling and is one that sticks with me, one that I don't forget. Um, but as I say, um, things are changing. Um, the books that we have loved are being transformed. The question is, are they going to be better? Um, so before I talk about some of the transformations that are going on, I want to talk a little bit about the history of books. And not just to give a history lesson, but to just sort of help you understand that actually books have, always, books have been changing over millennia. They haven't always looked exactly like they are now, so it's, it's not that awful that they're changing. So to start with, um, I wanted to go way back in history to the Bronze Age. People long ago figured out a way to preserve writing that's important to them. What they would do is that they would take these wet clay tablets, and then they would take a stylus, and they would write writing that they would want to preserve. I love that those terms are so current, the tablet and the stylus. Um, and, and this was a long, long time ago. People innovated and came up with um, better ideas better ways to save writing that they wanted to preserve. And what, one of the things that became really important were scrolls. Scrolls were very efficient. They were used in ancient Egypt and Greece and Rome. And they're a way to preserve even more writing um, in a little more handable, in a way that's a little easy to handle. And, um, and the, Ro the Romans used it. And then the Romans came up with a really good idea. So they used to. Um, in addition to using scrolls, they used these wooden tablets that they put wax on. And if they wanted to save writing, they would write on this warm wax. And um, when it dried, they would have this preserved writing. If they wanted to save a bunch of these tablets, they would stack them. And they, when they stacked them, they looked like rectangular boxes. In time, what they started doing was they started cutting up scrolls. So they, their scrolls would be in columns. The text would be on columns. They would slice them up, and they would stack those sheets of, um, of papyrus or whatever they were using, whatever material they were using. And they would stitch them together, and they would put a harder cover on it. And lo and behold, they had what they called a codex, but which was really the origin of books. And this model really worked well. And it was used for centuries. These kinds of books took a long time to make. They were handmade. Um, not, they were expensive, the materials were expensive, so books weren't as abundant um, as they would come, become later. But as you know, in the 15th century, um, a guy named Gutenberg invented uh, a press, which made it much easier to make books. No longer did you have to have people hand make them. Um, and the, as over time, presses became more efficient, and um, people were able to create uh, books more easily, they became cheaper. By the time of the Industrial Age, we started getting powered presses, which really helped make the process quicker. Um, there were steam-powered presses. Into the 20th century, they, books became, it became more easy to make books. They became cheaper. They became more abundant. We could put photographs in them. We started with black and white photographs, and then we ended up with colored photographs. And the book, as we know it, was very stable during all of the 20th century, and into the 21st. But then, an outfit called Amazon came up with this idea to have an um, e-reader. 
this just happened in 2007. For some of us, that is just a few minutes ago. Um, and the, the digital book industry was launched. And it's doing very well. Um, a lot of digital books are being sold. In fact, in 2012, 20% of the books that were sold were digital books. Um, there were 547 million hardcover books published that year, and there were 457 million digital books downloaded. But when people are, we're buying, we're buying them, obviously, and I know all of you probably have multiple platforms in which you can download them. But when people are surveyed when they're asked about these books, they frequently have some complaints and about digital books because they miss, and many of you may too, they miss the feeling of traditional books, you know, the weight, the smell, the fact that you can kind of breeze through easily and go back and see what you had just read. And I think the complaints are well-founded. And the reason why, I'll try to demonstrate here. So this is a, a copy of a digital book that I downloaded. Um, it's Stephen Ambrose's wonderful book called Undaunted Courage um, about the um, expeditions by Lewis and Clark. It's a fabulous book. So, but in my E version of it, I can do some things I can't do in my paper version, but not really that much. I can type in notes that I can hide. I can search for terms. I can go to the internet. I can go to Wikipedia. But even for a word person like me, it's not that much value added compared to what I lost, which is some of the qualities that I think a lot of us like in books. And the good news is that we're not stuck with this kind of um, e-publication. Some really interesting things are happening in um, digital publishing. And the example that I want to talk to you about is the one that I'm most familiar with. And it's a, a book that's in the process of being developed. It's called E.O. Wilson's Life on Earth. And it's a biology textbook. It's digital only. There's no paper version. It's just a digital product. Um, Dr. Wilson, some of you may know of him. He is a very prominent biologist. He's also an ardent conservationist. Um, he believes that if people know about biology, they're more likely to try to save living things on Earth. And if there was ever a time where we needed to be thinking about living, saving living things on Earth, it's right now. So he's assembled a team, and it's led by um, a veteran textbook uh, editor and a um, wonderful science um, visualization innovator and a really talented animator, and then some other of us word people who are helping out. And um, they are trying to use kind of the digital tools to create books that have more impact um, and that really try to achieve those traits, which I love most about books, which is to go deep into a topic, use artful storytelling, and to um, present information in a way that sticks. So I want to show you a few examples, which I find encouraging. This is um, a figure. We call them, I books call it widgets, but which I don't really understand, so I'm going to call it a figure because it makes more sense to me. But um, that tries to show how much of Earth is alive. The thing I like about it, there are no um, percentage, point, percentage marks or, or no graphs on it. It uses a different approach to telling this story. The entire Earth is an ecosystem, a community of organisms and its abiotic surroundings. The surroundings are land, water, and an atmosphere. What do they look like separately? All of the water on Earth is a droplet compared to the planet, a thin film of wetness. The atmosphere is matter, just like water, but 1,800 times less dense. The entire biosphere, all of life on Earth. We have to zoom in to see it at all. In that speck are as many as 10 million species. Over three billion years, life has spread out and adapted to fill every habitable space on the planet. I like that a lot better than the Ambrose 
uh, treatment. And there are a couple others that I want to show you, just to show you the kind of variety of innovation that's going on in this one project. So I know um, many of you have read about human evolution, probably here. And, um, and one of the most important aspects of understanding human evolution is how um, our lineage changed over time um, to accommodate what's probably our most distinctive asset, which is our big brain. And what had to happen in, um, over time is that um, the skull of, um, of our from, in development from our ancestors to now had to change profoundly. It had to kind of get reorganized to accommodate the big brain. So this is a way to try to describe that better than I just did. Um, and this is it's uh, depicting what a distant ancestor of ours looked like four million years ago. And this one, you use your hand, so it's an effort to have a little more of that kind of physical contact that we've lost with books. And it shows the sort of change that had to occur. You know, the brow had to recede, the jaw had to get smaller, and then the skull really had to get bigger to become us. And what's neat about this is you can kind of linger on it, you can touch it, you can kind of, you can kind of puzzle over it. and land there. The other example I wanted to show you is one I particularly like because um, it, sorry, my, my iPad, here we go. Sometimes my iPad does what I want it to do, and sometimes my <laughs> iPad doesn't do what I want to do, but we're in the right place now. Um, I wanted to show you this example because I particularly love it because it talks, it talks about something that I think is frequently boring in textbooks, in biology textbooks, and it's about, it's in cell biology, and it's about cytoskeletons. Not exactly a thrilling topic, right? But in fact, they are fascinating and they're key to the success of life. Um, and it's really hard to display this on a printed page. You can't really draw it. You can't even, as a wordsmith, I would love to be able to do, to do it, but it's, you can't. But I think they come much closer to giving this topic of cytoskeletons its due. The cytoskeleton is a dynamic network of filamentous proteins that extends throughout the cytoplasm, forming the struts, cables, and girders that give the cell its shape, internal organization, and mechanical support for movement. There are several types of protein filament, each built from subunits that rapidly come together or break apart, allowing these elaborate structures to be assembled and dismantled wherever they are required by the cell. Microtubules are stiff, hollow tubes that anchor other organelles and serve as tracks that guide the movement of vesicles and other cell components. Actin are thin, flexible filaments that form cross-linked bundles and branching networks. Actin is particularly important for cell movement. They are central to the contractile engine in muscle cells and provide the mechanical force for cell movement at the plasma membrane. So who knew? Cytoskeletons are so cool. And, um, from a narrative point of view, one of the things that's so successful about this approach, I think, is that it shows how dynamic life is. It's very difficult to display that in any other way besides moving pictures. And another um, attribute of this that I admire is that it really tries to be biologically accurate. So you've got all these like tiny proteins kind of assembling themselves. And um, I don't know, I don't think a textbook, a paper textbook could do that. So in addition to the innovation that we're seeing in content in books that I find really exciting, I think the other thing that's exciting and that will improve upon the treatment of Stephen Ambrose's books is um, that with this new 
um, technology for making books is coming a new system for publishing books, and which I think is going to result in more books. And the way that I'm going to um, explain this to you is to tell a story about a writer who some of you um, here may know. His name is um, David Dobbs. And uh, David Dobbs is a very accomplished science writer. And he's written books. And he's published in a lot of elite um, journals. And he had an idea that he had to write. And it was an idea that he learned about on his mother's deathbed. It's not a science, it's not a science story. His mother confessed to the family that she didn't want to be buried in the family plot, as had been planned for years. Instead, she wanted to be cremated, and she wanted her ashes to be distributed in the Pacific Ocean so that she could be near Angus, she told them. They're like, who's Angus? Well, it turns out Angus was her lover, her married lover, um, who she knew many years ago. It had been 60 years before she died. Um, and for a while, in, they lived together for a while in Hawaii. He was a medical doctor, and he was a, in the Air Force. And he was on a team of people who, in the Pacific, went looking for pilots who, um, whose planes went down. And they had a very, very, very passionate love affair. And he died um, when he was out on one of these efforts to look for a pilot. So David Dobbs was just so inspired by this story. He wanted to find out more about his mother. He wanted to find out about who the heck was Angus. And he wanted to find out about more about World War II. So he embarked on this process of reporting and writing. And then he started knocking on the doors of all of his um, friends in publishing, just saying, you want to publish it? You want to print it? And person after person said, no, thank you. It just didn't quite sort of suit their needs. He, had, he was burning to tell his stories, talented author, um, incredible researcher, but he couldn't find anybody until he had a conversation with someone who's founding a new digital publishing house called The Atavist in Brooklyn, where, which is a pocket you guys probably know of a lot of innovation right now. There are a lot of really interesting things happening there. And the fellow who runs The Atavist said, OK, I'll run it. So um, he. They, the atavists agreed to do it, and they created this beautiful um, multimedia publication. It included things that you couldn't have, like life on Earth, that you just simply can't have in, in a, a standard paper book, including footage of these teams that went out during World War II and tried to save pilots after they dumped in the ocean. The thing that I love about this story is that it sold. It was a huge success. So this thing he couldn't get published through conventional methods was um, a huge success in the digital marketplace. Why I find this promising is that what's happening in, with digital publishing is that not only are we seeing the kind of innovation in the pages of digital books that I think is really exciting, even can make cytoplasm and cytoskeletons exciting. But there are more venues opening up. So there are going to be more places where people can publish. And no longer will there be a small group of tastemakers deciding what we can read. There are going to be a larger group of tastemakers deciding what we can read. So that means that I will have more books to put on my bookshelf by my front door. And I will have more books to put on my digital bookshelf in my iPad, and I think we're all going to be better off for it. So thank you very much.